Can you beat Pokemon Yellow with only the gift Pokemon? Yes, but that's because the gift Pokemon you get are pretty solid, and you get a bunch of them. But what if you don't let them evolve? Now that sounds like a challenge. Hi guys, this is Battlemaster Ace, and I'm here to answer an age-old question about Pokemon Yellow. Do you really need to evolve these gift Pokemon for them to be effective? Pokemon Yellow was the very first Pokemon game I ever played, and it stayed my favorite for years. I really relied on the gift Pokemon back in the first run to fill in the Pokedex with their powerful evolutions and varied movesets. But can we still beat the game without catching, or evolving, a single Pokemon? That's what we're gonna find out. Here are the rules to the challenge. We can only use gift Pokemon, period. Pikachu is a gift, so I'll be counting her as a gift Pokemon. We aren't allowed to evolve any Pokemon, especially since Pikachu can't evolve anyway. No trades, in-game or otherwise, we sell and toss all Pokeballs. No breeding, but Gen 1 doesn't have breeding anyway, so we'll just outlaw the daycare. No items in battle, and we do a set battle style only, just so counter picks are just like in the competitive market, you have to waste a turn for it. Otherwise, let's be as creative as we want. Okay? Okay. Let's go into Pokemon Yellow. So to do this run, obviously, we need a new save file. We name our character Virgil, the name our rival Ebon. This is going to be a theme for the whole video, comment down below if you get the reference. We wake up in our room, 3D print some Pokemon prescription medication, and then run around Pallet Town. You know the story, you can't find anyone at the lab, wander into some grass, and of course the nutty Professor Oak shows up. He rescues us from a Pikachu, who has wandered incredibly far outside of its typical territory in the Viridian Forest. Then we wander over to his lab to meet with his grandson, Ebon. We're planning on starting the run with Eevee, but Ebon shows his true colors and snatches our starter. Even though Professor Oak implied that he had an Eevee for Ebon later, meaning we still could have gotten an Eevee. But he doesn't have time for that now. Instead, Professor Oak provides us with our very first gift Pokemon. This is Pikachu, if you somehow didn't know. In-game, Pikachu is a two-stage evolution Pokemon, so it has some pretty decent early game stats. The biggest thing about Pikachu is its blinding speed. Base 90 is nothing to shake a stick at, and with proper training, it outspeeds every little cup Pokemon except for Voltorb and Diglett in the game. It's also a pure electric type, meaning defensively it resists the plentiful flying type Pokemon in the game. And offensively, it gets extra power when attacking the plentiful water type Pokemon and flying type Pokemon in the early to mid game. It's worth noting that Pikachu is a special attacker, which is going to help us out the most when the stat debuffs in the early game target our physical attributes instead of our special ones. Pikachu takes on the moniker of Static to keep with our theme. Ebon challenges us to our first official Pokemon League battle. There isn't much strategy to beat the rival here, or on the Thundershocks. He attacks randomly and will occasionally use Tail Whip. My application of the strategy resulted in a first turn paralysis and a failed Tail Whip from Eevee. The rest of the match was a cakewalk. Five clean thundershocks did the job. We are rewarded with some good XP and a new move in Tail Whip, which we will need later, and of course a snarky remark from Ebon. Also it's worth noting that Static has made two decisions. Number one, she doesn't like Pokeballs, and number two, she doesn't like us. Hopefully one of those things will change. We take off without any rhyme or reason at this point and end up in Viridian City. There we get sent on an errand by the local shopkeeper. He received a package for Professor Oak and expects us to deliver it for free. Evidently, ship to store is the only option the professor had for online shopping back in 1998. 
We make it back down to Palatown without incident, and then our Pokemon journeys begin. Oak hands us an Ebon the Pokedex to start our Pokemon challenge of catching all of the Pokemon. But little does Professor Oak know, we won't be doing any of that. No, instead we go to Professor Oak's house to get a map from his granddaughter Daisy. Ebon went home first to take a map, and he told his sister not to give us one. Then he caught us with his sister and decided to give us one himself. Shortly after, we ran into Ebon on our way to check out what was down the road from Viridian City. I knocked out a few random Pidgey and Rattatas, so I'm up to level 9. Feeling pretty confident here. I forgot this was a two-on-one battle, but luckily Ebon has only added Spearow to his ranks. After a brief exchange of attacks, we get the win. Eevee's a little trickier, though. We had pretty good luck last time, but I highly doubt that Thundershock is going to do the trick. So we start the match off with a Thunder Wave instead. That leaves us free to rain down Thundershocks on Ebon's poor starter. Pikachu's defenses are still pretty frail, so having the free turn of Paralysis is helpful. We even push through a Sand Attack for the knockout. The nice thing about Pikachu is that it's a little bit of a crit machine. It has a roughly 17.5% chance of getting a critical hit, just over 1 in 6, so expect a lot of those. With that one under our belt, we decide to go investigate all this badge nonsense that Ebon is on about. The Viridian Forest doesn't offer much resistance, as Static has some pretty solid speed stats, and String Shot doesn't actually bother us any. Also, Static's a special attacker, so Metapod's Harden doesn't offer any extra defense. Now here's the real issue. Pewter City Gym. This is what we're working with, and this is what we're facing. Challenge is over, thank you for coming. No, 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 that's not true. Normally I'd be on the hunt for a Nidoran male, a Mankey, or maybe I'd just train up my Caterpie into a Butterfree at this point, but I have a different plan this time. We do take a little bit of time to do a level grind. We'll need a level 15 Pikachu to pull this off. Luckily, Static is up for the challenge, and we face off with Brock and his apprentice. The first battle is with the Gym Trainer. There, he sends out Diglett. Diglett would normally outspeed Pikachu, but because we have a healthy level advantage, we can cheese out a win with Quick Attack. Then, it's time to put our strategy to the test. I ditch Thunder Wave in favor of Double Team. Since electric moves won't work on the ground types we'll be facing in the next dungeon in Mount Moon, it's the least helpful move. I get to testing Double Team, and it's pretty successful. I'm able to dodge most attacks and comfortably whittle down Sandshrew after just three Double Teams. Static is actually impressed with the strategy and gives me a compliment. This is short-lived, but at least she's starting to bond with us. Round 2, we face off against Brock not so Lesnar. My biggest concern is Geodude. There's good news and bad news about Brock. The good news is his Pokemon are lower levels to accommodate your Pikachu. The bad news is... Geodude only has damaging moves, so it's hard to stay at high health when you're facing him. I'm expecting to have to level up to up to level 20 to get Slam if I really want to win, but just for kicks I decided to battle Brock at level 15 anyway. Static maxes out with double teams, and then starts to apply Tail Whip. Six Tail Whips seems to be sufficient and allowed us a 3 hit KO. We applied the same strategy to Onix. The nice thing about Onyx is that he consistently uses Bide. That leaves us ample time to set up with Tail Whip. Not sure what was up with Brock's programming, but Onyx only used non-damaging moves. And between our high evasion and Gen 1 programming, we actually cheesed out a really clean win. I didn't think it would be this consistent. Static was hyped over the win in what was probably the luckiest Pokemon battle I've ever had and we move on through Mount Moon. Mount Moon is largely uneventful. I avoided most of the hikers because I didn't want a repeat performance of Brock and having to spam double team. In doing so, I ran into the super nerds instead, who reminded me that there's no steel type in Gen 1, so I can hit Magnemite with quick attack. We also beat up a few rocket grunts before picking up a fossil. We pick the, actually, I'm not telling you what fossil we pick. Comment your guess down below. The fossil will appear later in the run, just for fun. What I will show you is our run with Team Rocket. No, not the Rocket Grunt, I mean Team Rocket proper. Regardless, they don't require much strategy. I fought a lot of trainers in the cave to make up for the money I spent on potions and antidotes for the journey though. As a result, Pikachu is massively overleveled here. Thundershock is sufficient to bring the trio down to their knees. Another side effect is we used a lot of potions and antidotes due to being poisoned in Mount Moon. As a result, Static has become our friend, so once we get to Cerulean City, we can finally add another member to the team. This is Bulbasaur. Bulbasaur is definitely a jack of all stats. The Mario, if you will. He's a bit beefier and packs a couple more resistances that we'll need later, but right now his biggest role will be as a status platform. 
Sadly, Bulbasaur suffers from a somewhat shallow move pool here in the early Gen 1 games. No coverage moves to speak of, and generally Grass doesn't get many good attacking options so his strength lies more in hindering the opponent than muscling through them. We name Bulbasaur Puff. I'm pretty sure you get the theme by now. Anyway, Puff needs a little training to be helpful, so we set him loose against Ebon, our rival. Ebon is back up to his old tricks trying to lower our stats, but now we can match up against his Pokemon a little more easily, and switching proves helpful. Spearow doesn't contribute much to the battle and neither does Sandshrew. I mean, Sandshrew puts up a lot of sand attacks, but you know. Rattata doesn't help much either, so we can gang up on Eevee for a clean win. Shaking off Sand Attack with a few smart switch-ins, of course. Ebon isn't thrilled, but Static sure is. Bit of a sadist, that one. Anyway, we move on and demolish the Nugget Bridge. No fights to ride home about. This, however, leads to the recruitment of our next team member. Meet Charmander. Charmander is offensively focused. Competitively, he's not too handy. Fire is a pretty bad type in red, blue, and yellow, sadly. And as for in-game utility, don't get too excited. From a purely technical standpoint, the Charizard line has the most disadvantages in Gen 1 even in-game. Charmander is offensively focused, but has defensive stats about the same level as Pikachu's, without any of Pikachu's punishing speed. Charmander does learn a few good offensive moves and may still be useful in the playthrough. We dub our Charmander Hot Streak and do some grinding before it visit to Bill's house. We zap Bill back to normal, sadly, and then get the SS ticket. Yes, I said sadly. I think a video game about a guy getting turned into a Pokemon would be pretty interesting to play. Just saying. Moving on, we challenge Misty, who I assume is going easy on this because she's sweet on us. Normally, I'd try and brute force through, but Starmie has amazing stats and might put us in a bad spot. I set up a strategy instead. Static goes out first to fight off Staryu. The solid level and type advantage secure the win, with a critical hit that totally mattered, of course. My next move is to stall out Starmie. Even without using a stab move, its physical attack is high enough to threaten us with tackles, so we set up a leech seed using Puff. We also apply more pressure with Poison Powder. The combination of Poison Powder and Leech Seed isn't as potent as Toxic and Leech Seed are, but it gets Misty thinking about defense. Due to the type disadvantage, Misty uses random attacks, including Harden. Her defenses are solid, but they're a little irrelevant given that both Bulbasaur and Pikachu are special attackers in this game with super effective moves. She can only delay the inevitable. With Misty soundly defeated, we decide that Team Rocket must be stopped, no matter the cost. They've robbed a house and face off against us. This brings us to a special fight. One that's a bit tougher with unevolved Pokemon for some reason. See, normally you'd have an Ivysaur and a Charmeleon at this point, maybe Pidgeotto and Nidorino, or something else with a little more bulk. But we don't because we keep avoiding evolution, meaning Machop and its cross chops do a lot of damage, and often critically hit. Even burning it straight off didn't cut the damage that much. And then there's Drowsy. Drowsy, for being a psychic type, is surprisingly bulky. It's just hard to take down smoothly. With no type advantage, there's no easy way to knock it out. And we don't have very strong moves at this point. I almost lost to this Drowsy, what with the lucky confusion and landing hypnosis and all. Honestly, if it had spammed confusion, I think the whole team would have gone down by the second round. But we don't, and we secure the TM for Dig. This frees us up to head down to Vermilion City and get the next party started. Static and company do a little money grinding for me to keep paying for these potions that we need to use on their fragile pre-evolved forms. This leads up to the SSN, home of the Cutmaster and the truck that people thought Mew lived under for some reason. The rumor in my school was you had to go to Witch Town to meet Mew after the SSN came back at the end of the game. Neither of these things would matter though, even if they were true because we're not interested in catching Mew. I'm actually here to raid the cabins and get as many items as we can. One of those includes the Body Slam TM. Funnily, Static's physical attack is a bit higher than her special attack, so it's nice to have that available. We find just the subject to test it on too. Ebon has just showed up to ridicule me on my decision not to catch Pokemon and only to battle them. But that decision has put my Pokemon in an incredible offensive position allowing Static to pick Spiro and Rattata apart with no effort. Puff took on Sandshrew, suffering continuous accuracy lowering, but not before pulling off the winning combo of Poison Powder Leech Seed. Meaning, even though our Vine Webs didn't hit the mark, we were delivering big chunks of chip damage. Sandshrew went down, but the damage was done. As we wasted attempts to try and land Poison Powders and Leech Seeds on Eevee, we finally fired off one successful Leech Seed and used it to switch Hot Streak in safely. 
Hot Street got to work immediately, launching a barrage of embers that resulted in a burn, nullifying Evie's tail whips, and ultimately scoring a W for Team Virgil. We accepted Static's cheers and our HM01 prize from the Sea Captain. We also remembered to teach Static Body Slam too, since we didn't end up needing the move for the battle against Ebon. Our next goal was to take on the mighty Lieutenant Surge. Hot Streak took on the responsibility of being the HM user and mastered the move Cut, slashing through to Vermilion City Gym. Lieutenant Surge's sailors and soldiers offered little resistance and we made it to the commanding officer's tent. My initial plan was to take on Raichu with Puff using a similar technique to the fight we had with Sandshrew to avoid being spammed out, but just for kicks, I figured Static could lead the fight off anime style. And anime style it goes. Pikachu and Raichu are nearly the same level and have a very similar moveset. Just like the anime, I start off with a series of double teams, meaning every shot that Raichu fires off misses. Raichu, to my surprise, was actually tied with Pikachu for speed, highlighting the stat difference between the monsters even with proper stat experience training. The Mega Punches flew when one finally hit, decimating Static's defenses. It was time to go on the offensive. Static delivered a body slam for the ages on Raichu in retaliation, bringing him down to half health. Unfortunately, Raichu also dropped a solid growl to weaken us. Defiantly, Pikachu finished the job with a final critical hit body slam to end the match. Our luck hasn't run out yet. As a reward, we gather the speed boosting Thunder Badge and the TM for Thunderbolt. The bad news is there's no one that can learn Thunderbolt right now. The good news is Static has learned it naturally, so we can save it as a coverage move for another Pokemon. Before we take Diglett's cave, we stop by Officer Jenny, who's got a Squirtle in the Scared Straight program. It's apparently too much trouble, so she strong arms us into fostering it. Squirtle is to defense as Charmander is to offense. He's got some fairly balanced stats with a certain focus on defense. It helps that Squirtle is also a pure water type, which is one of the best types in the entire franchise. That means he also gets ice moves, so that's a boon too. Unlike Charmander, however, he doesn't have too many other quality coverage moves. And unlike Bulbasaur, he doesn't have a solid defensive dual typing or one that helps manipulate a competitive opponent. But for an endgame run, Squirtle is good early, mid, and endgame to answer rock, ground, and fire types that roam about Kanto, with anti-flying and grass coverage moves to help protect itself. We accidentally dubbed Squirtle Aqua Marina. I meant to name him Aqua Maria, but that's okay, we can fix that in Lavender Town. The bad news about Aqua Maria is he's underleveled for our spot in the game. The good news is Diglett's Tunnel is right next door, so we can train him up on the way to pick up the old Amber from Brock in Pewter City. We also still have the TM for Bubble Beam from Misty, which is a relatively high-powered move for this spot in the game, and since Squirtle has pretty good special stats, it makes leveling up a breeze. Our next trip is through Rock Tunnel. I don't have enough Pokemon to get the Flash HM since we've committed not to catching any Pokemon and only using Gift Pokemon. Therefore, I run into practically every trainer in the dungeon. The good news is Static doesn't have to fight the mandatory hiker in the tunnel, so Puff and Aqua Maria have a field day beating down the Onyx and Geodude on the path. Hot Streak has to take a hot seat during most of the trip though. Once we arrive in Lavender Town, we take a quick trip to the name raider and correct our typo for Aqua Maria. I don't know how he feels about the name, but I'm still fine with it. Static and the starter squad come hunting with me to find our next team member in Celadon. It's Eevee, the evolution Pokemon. Eva! Eevee actually has some pretty solid stats, all around good stats really. It also gets stab normal moves, stab meaning same type attack bonus. So moves like Bite, Takedown, and Swift all get a little bit of extra power when Eevee uses them. Another great thing about Eevee is how many evolutions it has. So it makes for a great Pokemon to breed and it can fill in the gap on any team. The problem in Gen 1 is that Eevee has no coverage moves and can't learn elemental moves until after it evolves into Jolteon, Flareon, or Vaporeon. I doubt that we'll put them to much use after we fill up our party, because as you know, we're not doing any evolutions. We name Eevee Mirage and he joins the team. He's mildly underleveled, but it won't take much for him to catch up. And what's a better place to train a new Pokemon than to take him to a secret gang hideout in the back of a casino? 
literally anywhere else, but this gang hideout thing is faster. Mirage takes the first few rounds, knocking fellow normal type Raticate for a loop, and adapting the double team strategy. Because of its relative frailty and lack of coverage moves, this is the ideal way to use Mirage that I've found. We took the time to beat up a few more rockets, just to kind of grind up a bit before facing the lead members of Team Rocket. The vast majority of Pokemon you'll meet in here are in the Raditza, Zubat, and Ekans evolution lines, with the occasional Drowsy or Machop thrown in for good measure. We got the card key and took the elevator, but not before we had our first rematch with Team Rocket. Hot Streak was the ideal Pokemon here, what with a base 100 move that's super effective against poison types. Also, Meowth has pretty lousy defenses and didn't offer much of a fight. Really, anyone probably could have won this, but Hot Streak was the most efficient. Giovanni, on the other hand, was surprisingly a little more intense. I found it odd that Jesse and James' Pokemon were roughly as strong as his, but it didn't matter much. Puff was my go-to mon here. Laying down Razor Leaf was all it took to win this match. Jeez, I wish he was around during my battle with Brock. Rhyhorn drops the same way. Persian is tougher. So we decided to leech seed that one. Persian delivers powerful bites and reduced stats with Growl. So once it was poisoned and seeded, static was in play. Persian has a pretty decent speed stat, and it actually has a surprisingly good special stat for this point in the game. But even that couldn't stand up to a Thunderbolt after all the damage it took from Poison Powder and from Leech Seed. Giovanni surrenders to Sylph Scope and sends us on our way. I should probably pop by Pokemon Tower, but I apparently haven't had enough of the seedy side of Celadon City. After rocking one more Team Rocket member, we head straight for the gym. It seems like this is going to be pretty much Hot Streak's gym, but we use a few of the gym trainers as experience point fodder. Everyone takes their turn with the gym trainers, who are all poison-loving sore losers by the way. But once all that is said and done, we cut our way to the center and take on leader Erica. Erika starts with Tangela, the only pure Grass-type Pokemon in the game. Tangela is a lot higher level than I remember, and a whole lot faster, pulling off a bind right away. It's clear that we aren't going to be able to just muscle our way through this one, so I focus on lowering Tangela's accuracy in hopes of boosting my evasion. Mirage pulls off one sand attack before getting knocked out. I sent in Static next and start building up double teams. To my surprise, Static is a bit more durable than I gave her credit for. She can't resist Tangela, though. Her counterattack results in a paralysis, and that frees us up to lay on the body slams. Despite the stat and type disadvantage, Static's speed and my tactics get us the win against Tangela. It's a 2 on 2 battle now, so Static drops another paralyzing body slam against Weepin Bell. Between her high evasion and the paralysis, Static pulls out another victory against the evolved Weepin Bell, making her 2 for 2 in this fight. It's funny, Static improved from a liability in this match to my most reliable soldier in the run entirely, even with type disadvantages. Static chips away at Gloom for a few good hits, but Gloom locks on with a pedal dance to finish the job. That means Hot Streak is in. Hot Streak takes a pedal dance to the face, but even with the level and stat disadvantage, it doesn't do much. Gloom can't beat the bad type matchup, and it loses to a couple well-placed embers. We leave with the rainbow badge firmly pinned to our chests and head back to heal our casualties. I'm actually really glad I didn't do this as a Nuzlocke because I would have lost half my team on that run. These levels are catching up fast, and so are the Pokemon evolutions. Static, on the other hand, just seems to be glad that A, she got to fight, and B, we won. So that's kind of cool, I guess. I really did love this mechanic where you could check on Pikachu and get a sense of how it felt about you during your journey. And today is no exception. On the way to Lavender Town, we unlock Saffron City, but there's not much to do there until we free Mr. Fuji from the Pokemon Tower anyway. There, Ebon the rival is skulking about, prompting us to have a fight in the graveyard. How disrespectful. Ebon leads off with Firo, whose speed advantage actually makes it waste a mirror move and gives Hot Streak a free turn. A couple quick slashes make quick work of it. Shelter is up next, and knowing how bad it's special is, Static goes to work here. Sadly, Shelter has Clamp and catches us off guard. Clamp is good for four attacks in a row until a Thunderbolt brings Shelter down in one shot. Vulpix tries to follow up, but Aqua Maria isn't too worried. Quick Attack does practically nothing, and Bubble Beam is a surefire one hit KO. We spread the experience to Puff, who suffers a sand attack, meaning our Razor Leaves continue to miss. We tank slashes until we finally get one off that sticks and send Sandshrew packing. I leave Puff in to use Leech Seed before sending in Mirage for a mirror match. 
mainly to rub in the fact that I'm the better EV trainer. Between the bites and leech seeds, the enemy EV doesn't stand a chance. This will also be the last easy rival fight of the game, I predict. We'll lose our level advantage soon, and this will be the last major battle with unevolved Pokemon. Battling the Chandler's Ghastlies is easy for the most part, and they serve as easy experience for Hot Streak, who up until we got to Celadon, didn't have much to do. Aqua Maria got in on some of the action too, but it took more time since I had forgotten that Bite isn't a dark move in Generation 1. Give me a break, I haven't played this in over a decade before this challenge. Also, it was worth noting that, aside from being a pivot for Static, Mirage was pretty much useless here. That's what I meant about coverage moves earlier. It's also worth noting that Eevee technically can beat this part of the challenge solo, but you need to use Bide to do it. It's time consuming and tedious, but not impossible. Finally, at the top of the tower, we have two fights. The first is against Cubone's mom. Marowak doesn't last long against Puff. Bone Club is strong, no doubt, but she still can't stand up to a razor leaf flurry critical hit. No strategy needed. Aqua Maria would have been able to do the same. Speaking of which, Aqua Maria leads off in our battle against who else but Team Rocket. Meowth starts off this time for some reason. We down it with a bubble beam, but not before taking bite damage and losing defense. And here's the next surprise. Ekans and Coughing have evolved into Arbok and Weezing for this part of the game. I know it doesn't seem like a big flourish, but little touches like this really make the game feel like it's trying to grow with you as a trainer. Mirage takes on Arbok after some chip damage and tanks a critical hit. Mirage bites back, but it's paralyzed in the process and ultimately defeats Arbok with a takedown. Weezing appears and it shows off its physical attack stat. Even Smog does surprising damage against the frail static, but not nearly as much as the Thunderbolt spam we let loose. Luckily, Team Rocket's AI is programmed pretty poorly here, akin to the regular Team Rocket actually, so they don't think to drop another sludge to finish the job. Mr. Fuji is rescued and hooks us up with a Poke Flute to continue our Pokemon adventure. We leave to the pier to do a little training with Static and Puff since these water type and flying type Pokemon are kinda up their alley. Also, neither of them are going to be terribly helpful in Koga's Poison Gym, so now is their time to shine. Also, it's worth noting that Poliwag is very fast at base 90, and it can very easily catch you in a hypnosis loop even with a level advantage, just FYI. It's also the point when I realized I didn't have a bike voucher and I had to run back to Vermilion City to get it from Mr. Pokemon while we're on the subject of speed. Then, after obtaining the bike, we decide to challenge the Saffron City Pokemon Gym. But since Team Rocket is still guarding it next door, we go for the fighting badge instead. What could possibly go wrong? Static and the starter squad are definitely a lot closer in level and stats to these Pokemon than we'd like to admit. Even coverage moves aren't doing much to the fighting types in this gym. And without flying your psychic type Pokemon, we're not getting very far. It's a slog to get to the fighting dojo leader, with every Pokemon we throw into the fray nearly fainting every single battle. Our stats are failing, so now we need to rely on the good old Virgil Hawkins wit to beat these bang babies. Once we face the head black belt, it's basically Puff versus the Hitmons. We go for a set damage strategy relying on Leech Seed to keep us in the game in lieu of healing items. Then fire away chip damage with Razor Leaf, attacking Hitmon Lee's weaker special stat. We try to do the same thing for Hitmon Chan, who opts to out speed in retaliation. We got back to the old Poison Seed combo poisoning Hitmonchan and leech seeding it in the process, thus putting the punching Pokemon on a time limit. Comet Punch does damage, but not enough to deter Static, who follows up with a lightning fast attack combo that wins the game, alongside Puff's quick leech seeding. Now this gym leader isn't much of a gym leader. Instead of giving us a badge that lets us use HMs and get past the gate of the Pokemon League, he instead offers us a Pokemon. We get to pick between Hitmonlee and Hitmonchan, two Pokemon that we just fought. It was a difficult decision. Hitmonlee offers pure power and is very offensive with a decent defense, but Hitmonchan offers versatility and has natural bolt beam coverage in the form of elemental punches. And despite its low special stat, it's the one we pick. So as you saw during the battle with the Black Belt, Hitmonchan has access to three exclusive moves, those being Fire Punch, Thunder Punch, and Ice Punch. All decent moves in their own right, and they make amazing coverage moves for Pokemon that can learn them. Sadly, in this game, they're not physical attacks, and miss out on Hitmonchan's amazing physical attack stat. But given our limited TM options in this game, Hitmonchan might be the right pick. Also, it's strong enough to actually use strength unironically in the battle, without it being a complete waste of a move. 
so we're not completely outmatched here. Hitmonchan chooses the nickname of Tantrum and joins the squad, meaning for the first time all game, we have a team of six Pokemon. And since Hitmonchan has better stats than most of the starter Pokemon, we can actually use him in the battle against Team Rocket. Given that we either have a choice of battling Koga at the gym, or even on our rival in Sylphico, and none of our Pokemon are remotely ready for that, we take a detour down the cycling road. Tantrum faces off against Snorlax again, and to my surprise is less effective than Puff was in that fight. Aqua Maria and Puff do a fine job of cleanup though. This has become less concerning as Hitmonchan is fine to beat down the bikers on the way down to Fuchsia City. Since there are so many poison types, Hot Streak gets in on the action too, using Dig most of the way down. It's also pretty much at this point that I realize Mirage will not be helpful going forward. It's nice that a normal type Pokemon don't have any major weaknesses in this game, but without him being able to strike super effectively, he's gonna weigh the party down. I really can't find a fight that he's helpful in, which is a shame. I really do like Eevee, but he's not suited for the Generation 1 environment without involving, with Let's Go being the only exception, because Eevee gets coverage moves in that game at least. We'll work that out later. For now, let's take a quick journey through the Safari Zone, where we get the Gold Teeth and Surf by the skin of our own Pearly Whites, and also earn the HM4 Strength. Since we're not using HM Masters, Tantrum takes on the responsibility of being the Strength Mon. I hold off on teaching anyone Surf yet, and instead fight my way to Saffron City. If we were to battle Koga right now, we'd certainly lose, as we'd be depending on Hot Streak to beat everyone there, and frankly, I have a better plan. We return to Saffron City yet again. At this point, Mirage has left the party and been deposited in the PC, so we can focus experience and stat training on other members of the party. After that, it's a full-on strike at Sylphco. Team Rocket and some of the Sylphco scientists have turned this building into a bunker. It's very much like the Rocket Hideout in that most rockets throw the Rattata, Zubat, and any poison-type Pokemon they can find at you. But in addition, you'll contend with scientists that specialize in Grimers and electric types like Magnemite and Voltorb. They still aren't terribly powerful and don't know that many powerful moves. Hot Streak's Dig did a great job of handling any scientists we accidentally ran into. Once again, our levels are catching up quick and our shallow move pools are showing. I planned on teaching someone on the team Earthquake, but no one in my party can learn it. Thankfully, we do get a good few moves, namely Hot Streak's Flamethrower to even the odds. Once we get to the very top of the tower, we run into our friend Ebon yet again. Something something, rival Fival. I know where the joke comes from, I just don't feel like stealing it from J-Rose. Also, I did the optional rival fight in this run, so this is technically rival 6 for me anyway. Regardless, this was definitely the toughest Ebon fight I've had to date. Now, the battle wasn't too terrible right away. Puff resisting Poison Sing was helpful in getting off a Razor Leaf to beat Sand Slash putting us in the lead right away. Aqua Maria was our answer to Ninetales. Ninetales wasted a few attacks on Roar thanks to great Gen 1 AI, and allowed us to get a clean knockout. Loyster showed up next, so we chipped away at it a bit before Aqua Maria got confused. Static took over and took an Aurora Beam on the switch, before turning around and hitting back hard with a Thunderbolt. She also took the liberty of taking down Kadabra with a quick body slam attack while she was out. Tantrum was the last one up effortlessly deflecting double kick before burning Jolteon with an agility boosted fire punch. Strength also did some major damage, allowing Puff to sneak in, but thanks to Gen 1 programming, we still got smashed by a 5 hit pin missile. Jolteon isn't a monster or a genuine demon. This thing is the devil itself, I'm fully convinced, and the final battle against it will be tough. Despite that, Ebon doesn't think he needs to offer any assistance against the remaining Rocket members and leaves me to face them by myself. What a creep. On the bright side, a worker at Sylphco watched our battle and passed us a Lapras for beating down our rival, who, once again, infiltrated an organized crime operation just to pick a fight with us. I cannot make this up. Lapras is an amazing Pokemon. I probably should have banned it, but using pre-evolves was enough trouble. And Lapras comes in at a low level, so it doesn't help much right now. In addition to its good stats, it offers a deep move pool of coverage moves. And while Water Ice typing isn't perfect, it offers stab on two of the best offensive moves in the game, being Surf and Ice Beam. Meaning that between those moves and Thunderbolt, we're looking at a special attacking tank of a Pokemon. Or I guess a battleship really, since it's a water type. 
Either way, Lapras is a very welcome addition to the team. We end up naming our Lapras Permafrost and invite our first ice type into the fold. I plan on teaching him how to surf as well. We'll put him to work later. But for now, we'll focus on the battle at hand with Giovanni. Or we would if it wasn't for one more bit of trouble. Well, make a double. Once again, Team Rocket's rockin', and they threaten us before we can face off with their boss. Weezing's up first this time, and I mistakenly let off with Puff. It doesn't matter much, Tantrum can come in and deliver a devastating critical hit on Weezing. Arbok suffers the same fate, but doesn't let us get away without paralyzing Tantrum first. Per usual, Static shows up and puts a shock to Meowth's system, finishing it with a critical thunderbolt and sending Team Rocket blasting off for good. On the way out, I have a meeting with Don Giovanni. He doesn't offer much in the way of a challenge. Even resisted, Puff can do a lot of damage with Razor Leaf, meaning a stat trained Bulbasaur is stronger than a Nidorino without TM moves. How bizarre is that? Persian is our next victim, who offers us a bribe. We pay him back with some Leech Seed and a fresh dusting of Poison Powder before Static takes over. Pikachu treats this like a rematch with Meowth and brings the thunder on Persian, outspeeding and outfighting the fancy cat. Aqua Maria handles Rhyhorn nicely with a bubble beam, as if there was any doubt, before attacking Nidoqueen the same way. The chip damage reduces her speed and leaves an opening for Hot Streak to put in the work with Dig. A final flamethrower ends the battle and earns us a Master Ball from the president of Sylphco. After that, we took Lapras out for a quick round of training, just to get him into the swing of things for the battle with Sabrina. Using Sing, Psychic, Body Slam, and Surf, most of the junior trainers and bikers don't stand a chance. We also traded Sing for Confuse Ray as it was our best stackable option with a few other statuses like the high chance of paralysis from Body Slam. Lapras comfortably beat practically every trainer in the gym and left the rest up to us. So our strategy going in was to rely on the physical strong moves that Static has to offer to weaken the Abra line before Permafrost could go in for the finishing blow. Ideally, Static might get a paralysis before she went down to a strong psychic attack, but Lapras would be the hero and Pikachu was just set up. With Hot Streak being the next fastest member of the team, waiting to do some damage with Slash in case of any barriers. We started off with a few double teams to help Static last a bit longer, what with the massive level disadvantage. Sabrina doubled down on defensive measures as well, depending on X defense to protect her Pokemon. She also landed a flash on Static, reducing her accuracy and forcing a miss on her quick attacks. Luckily the next body slam knocked Abra on its... Kadabra, I suppose. I'd noticed this before, but all of Sabrina's Pokemon being the same level in evolution line really makes it feel like she's only got the one, and every time you beat it, it just evolves again to give you another go. Kinda like Digimon, really. Nothing groundbreaking, I just thought it was kinda neat. Anyway, regarding Kadabra, it didn't last too long, and it forced an Alakazam switch in. Alakazam started with a pointless recover, followed up with a reflect. We continued to spar, neither player successfully getting a hit. Static landed a solid Thunderbolt that granted us a paralysis, and gave us the opening we needed to finish the job with a body slam earning us the marsh badge. Back to back gym battles, the next battle was against Koga. We did very little to almost no training in preparation for Koga. I think Permafrost ended up at level 40 and learned a few new moves. Once again, the trainers of the gym offer no challenge, despite their now advanced levels. Having stab on ice beam is a lot more helpful than we give it credit for. Now for the battle with Koga. The good news is there were no terribly effective bug moves on his Pokemon. The bad news is the coverage move Psychic was incredibly bad for Tantrum. Despite that, Tantrum seemed like a good Pokemon to lead off with, considering it had the second best stats on the team. While Fire Punch was also helpful, Tantrum lost 33% of its special attack power very early on and forced to switch to Permafrost, which wasn't a big deal until it turned out we switched into a Toxic. Permafrost, Surf, and Ice Beams were enough to fight off Venonat and keep us ahead for now. Static saved Permafrost from Toxic long enough, then let loose for some chip damage. It was all in vain, however, as between the Psychic Attack and Poison, Static couldn't finish this one. Hot Streak took over, earlier than intended, and ended the third Venonat with a Flamethrower. Then came Venom Moth. We switched to Spamming Dig, since Venom Moth outsped Charmander but we still got caught on the switch. Also, double team appearing didn't help much, and Venomoth, of all things, was bulky enough to survive a psychic. From then on, Koga had complete control of the match as I struggled to take down his last Pokemon. His stall strategy had us in quite the pickle. Hail Mary Thunderbolt, no dice. Puff landed a Leech Seed, but not before getting leeched life to death in return, meaning everything we had done to Venomoth was pointless. Also, Aquamaria had been poisoned, 
and with two or three double teams, I was preparing for the inevitable. Tantrum couldn't do the job, and neither could Permafrost. Aqua Maria had no chance here. But before it ended, the Hail Mary Ice Beam actually did the job. Leech Seed kept us just ahead of the poison, but the scummy freeze is what saved the day. And now, without any other reason not to, Aqua Maria let loose with every attack he had. But we weren't out of the woods yet. We still needed to hit a final attack to earn the win. Luckily, the final bubble beam did the job, preventing the blackout and winning us our closest battle yet. I wasn't really sure if Tantrum could pull us out if we lost Aqua Maria, to be honest. Being down in stats, evolutions, and levels was really taking its toll. If Koga was this difficult, who knew how difficult Blaine would be? So during the next challenge, I prepared for Blaine. I took the route down through the Seafoam Islands, mainly for training, and also because I didn't have a flying Pokemon to fly my way to Pallet Town, thanks to my own arbitrary challenge rules. Either way, the trainer battles were just kind of there, and they offered enough monetary incentive to continue. I landed on the south side of Cinnabar Island, and then did a little shuffling around to make room for our next team member. Last chance to guess who made it on the team out of the two fossil Pokemon before the reveal. I took it to the scientist in the lab next door, then headed out to the Pokemon Mansion. Static and the squad got a little more training in, in preparation for the battle with Blaine. Though my newest team members were meant to make that a whole lot easier anyway. While I wandered through the puzzle, I decided to read all the Mew entries too. I remember being real excited about the Mew entries as a kid as I really wanted one, thinking I'd catch one at the end of the dungeon like Zapdos and Articuno. But sadly I didn't. Luckily my best friend, who is still my best friend to this very day 20 years later, had one that he traded me for a Rattata, so basically for free. But enough about that, let's meet our newest teammate now that we have the secret key from the Pokemon Mansion. Alright guys, it's time for the reveal, our scientist resurrected Kabuto. Now you may be asking why Kabuto? Well as much as I like the Lord Helix meme, Kabuto is more offensively powerful and has higher speed, both of which are more important in PvE runs. Also it has the benefit of learning the wall breaking move Slash, so its natural moves are a bit more solid than Omastar's. Also I've used up most of the good TMs, so he's ultimately the better choice. Then also also, factor in the coverage move Absorb for use against fellow water types, and we have a winner. Feel free to express your disappointment in the comment section down below below that this Mareep has strayed from the flock, oh lord Helix, forgive me. I had to take Kabuto, who we named Shiv, out for training while I leave one last member of the team with this scientist. This is our final team member, and I'm really planning on putting him to work in these upcoming battles here in the late game. And finally, we have Aerodactyl, our final team member. <laughs> Surprisingly, Aerodactyl, despite having the best stats of all the fossil Pokemon, is the worst of the fossil Pokemon. Don't get me wrong, he has amazing stats. That attack stat is nothing to mock, and the rock flying typing is one of my favorites. But it has no rock type stab moves and only gets one competitively viable flying move in wing attack, forcing Aerodactyl to double down on coverage options like Fire Blast and even Takedown as a primary attacking move. I'd consider banning this one in any other generation, except in Gen 1 where its pitiful move pool is actually a handicap. We do some more training in preparation for Blaine, then Storm his base. There we answer all the quiz questions right, even the ones that don't make sense. Though I do misclick on TM28. Funny that Rock Tomb came out just a couple games later, so I guess Blaine kinda preemptively named the move. While we're on the subject of Blaine, he makes it very clear that my Pokemon are grossly underleveled and underpowered. Thankfully, Shiv's defenses are incredibly helpful in this battle against fire types, which is objectively one of the worst types in Generation 1. Even so, Surf does virtually nothing to Ninetales, while Ninetales Flamethrower demolishes Shiv. I try to tag in Talon, who can abuse his high attack stat with the move Fly. He can also throw up a Reflect to increase his very sad defense stat, so that was helpful. That combined with Fly means basically every move Rapidash used was useless too. Arcanine has a 15 level advantage over basically the entire team, and is naturally faster than literally everyone. Also, it has a brutally powerful flamethrower that picks apart Talon. Aqua Maria then picks up the pieces, successfully tanking a full power fire blast, and then return fire with a hydro pump that would pierce the heavens, 
or at least it pierced Arcanine, meaning that we only have one badge to go. So, no time to waste, off to Viridian City. There we finally finish what we started and take on the final gym leader in the region. Luckily at this point, most of our team is actually designed for facing off against strong ground type Pokemon, as all of our Pokemon are flying or water at this point with the exception of Pikachu. There's hardly any challenge from the gym trainers, at least not enough to mention. So that only left the leader, old man Don Giovanni. Giovanni starts off strong with a level 50 Doug Trio, rocking the battle with an earthquake. Puff is still able to one-shot it with a Razor Leaf, but that health is so low that he was out of the fight early. Talon picks up the slack with a Reflect, but this does nothing to dampen Persian's insane critical hit rate. Double Team makes Persian harder to hit. Also, its slam is more than enough to slice through defenses and put me on notice. Talon is down by the second round. Thankfully, Static can step up to the plate and speed tie with Persian. She wins and opens a spot for Permafrost. Nidoqueen does a lot of damage to our Lapras, but this opens us up to test our ultimate move, Blizzard. And on a very defensive mon like Nidoqueen, we nearly get a one-hit KO. We also survive Nido King's Thunder and fire off a final Surf. Expecting Lapras to go down, I leave him in to make sure my next switch on Nido King is clean. But thanks to Gen 1 AI, Nido King just takes a guard spec instead, leaving him open for a Surf attack. So that just leaves right on. Once again, anticipating full paralysis or a knockout, I leave Lapras in and shoot for a Surf. And once again, Giovanni fails to attack and uses a guard spec. And to add insult to injury, we pull off a critical hit surf with Lapras to end the job. Pikachu is truly over the Lunatone with excitement, and frankly, I am too. That battle was too close, especially for it being Giovanni. Who knew Persian was such an underrated Pokemon? With that, it's time for our final badge check on the way to Victory Road. But of course, we can't do that without a visit from our old buddy Ebon. Honestly, I don't even want to battle him here. But now that he has a full team, the match should be interesting. Rival semi-final, let's go. Sand Slash is up first, and I won't risk a Gen 1 miss, trying to hack through Aqua Maria's defenses. We respond with a Hydra Pump. One whiffs, one hits. No more Sand Slash. Execute is up next, and actually steals our strategy of seeding bulky opponents. Flamethrower nullifies this so we don't get Leech Seeded. We attack Ninetales from below ground to avoid extra damage from it while Leech Seed chips away. A benefit to having first stage Pokemon, there isn't much HP to steal. Static shocks our way into the battle with a Thunderbolt straight to Cloyster's face, resulting in a Paralyzed Pearl at the center. The follow-up Aurora Beam doesn't stop us when we hit it again for the knockout. Kadabra is Elon's next attempt to take me down, and it too suffered paralysis, this time thanks to Body Slam. Potions be darned, there's no way out here. So finally, Puff hits the field to face off with Jolteon and gets bombarded with Pin Missile. We get lucky and hit a Sleep Powder, then set up Leech Seed and Razor Leaves. I legitimately didn't think that would work, but I'm glad it did. So now we have a new strategy to use against Jolteon in the finals. Assuming we get that far, of course. While Static could outspeed Kadabra, I don't think she can outspeed Jolteon in a straight fight. Ebon once again gets ahead of us, but Static is so stoked for the win that we charge right after him. I mean, how far ahead could he possibly get anyway? Badge check goes as normal. So, I enter Victory Road with Static, Permafrost, Talon, Shiv, Tantrum, and Hot Streak. There are lots of rock, flying, and fighting Pokemon on the road, so I figured they'd be the team I'd want to warm up before the fight with the Elite Four. When I was a kid, I always assumed the trainers on Victory Road were other trainers that beat the gym leaders like the player and the rival did, especially since a few of them had starter Pokemon. One of these days, I'd like to see an Elite Four battle have a prelude tournament of some kind like they did in the Pokemon Sword and Shield anime, or in Pokemon Stadium. You know, give us a sense that other trainers are successfully pulling off these matches too. Yeah, I know, Sword and Shield did that too, but I was thinking of some AI with more specific strategies, toxic stall, and fear tactics. Maybe someday. While I was babbling about that though, we beat the cave. The final lineup ended up being Static the Pikachu, with a move list of Double Team, Thunderbolt, Seismic Toss, and Body Slam. Puff the Bulbasaur with a move set of Sleep Powder, Toxic, Leech Seed, and Razor Leaf. Hot Streak the Charmander with a moveset of Flamethrower, Slash, and Dig. Also cut, but, you know, cut. 
Tantrum the Hitmonchan with a moveset of Strength, Submission, Ice Punch, and Thunder Punch. Permafrost the Lapras with a moveset of Surf, Thunderbolt, Blizzard, and Psychic. And finally, Talon the Aerodactyl with a moveset of Fire Blast, Reflect, Fly, and Takedown. I started the team at level 48 and fought a valiant battle against the Elite Four, but sadly I lost all that footage. Well, not so much lost, but kinda screwed up. You see, before the battle I went to gather a few items I missed, mainly elixirs and rare candies for the battle. So I moved my recording windows around a little bit, and as a result I moved my Game Boy too far out of the recording window, and only caught like a third of it all, meaning I missed off on showing off the end of the luckiest run I've ever had in my life. So using this epic final battle footage as reference, it's time to see if the luckiest run ever really was good luck or if I could actually beat the game twice with the same team, but about two levels higher for consistency. First was Lorelei. This was pretty much identical to my first run. Static lined up first and did some serious damage with a thunderbolt against Dugong. To my surprise, it took a takedown without flinching, and also dropped Cloyster with an easy critical hit. Slowbro proved a bit tougher, so I resorted to Seismic Toss for guaranteed damage. Hot Streak swooped in next to fight off Jinx, and barely managed to survive an Ice Punch. You see, Fire doesn't resist Ice in Gen 1 Kanto, so getting hit by Lovely Kiss and then another Ice Punch was too much for Hot Streak. Static returned to Revenge Kill though, and hit hard with Body Slams. Hot Streak won the fight on the first run, but no matter. Tantrum came in next to sponge a blizzard that I didn't expect as Lorelei got a killer Gen 1 critical hit. Permafrost wasn't amused though and high rolled a Thunderbolt, putting us nearly in a neat 3 hit KO range with a paralysis to spare. It was a little closer in the first run, but the win was practically the same in losing Tantrum. After healing, Bruno was our next battle. Puff was our lead and easily decimated Onyx. I wanted to get a free switch in, so I took advantage of Hitmonchan's bad special stat to put it to sleep, after tanking a bad ice punch. Permafrost was my go-to, and he did indeed go to town, using Psychic to obliterate Hitmonchan and Hitmonlee. Bruno sent out Onyx, probably more out of habit than as an AI choice. There was no chance against the Surf. Machamp ended up in a similar position, barely taking a Psychic, but getting washed out with Surf. Bruno, per usual, is the worst Elite Four member in the game. Honestly, I would have preferred that he was the Viridian City Gym Leader and Giovanni faced you as member number two. It's more believable that way. Agatha is always a challenge, not particularly because her Pokemon are OP. I mean, Haunter and Gengar are pretty strong, but what makes her hard is her off-the-wall moveset. Toxic stall tactics, substitutes, sleep moves, and the like. Hot Streak was up first and triggered a few substitutes on Gengar. We kept attacking with Dig to slowly burn HP and get it in range of a knockout. This also helped us avoid Confuse Ray and beat the first fully evolved OU Pokemon on her team. I went in for a little chip damage using Flamethrower, but it wasn't much more than an annoyance to Golbat, encouraging me to switch to Static. Golbat managed to pull off a Toxic, but it had to take a Thunderbolt to the face in exchange. We sent in Talon as a pivot against Haunter, as Pikachu would start suffering from the Toxic damage very shortly. Talon also struggled with both sleep and confusion at the freaky floaty hands of Haunter. Eventually, we got out of the lock and flew into a third KO. Arbok was next, so I continued the aerial attack. Little did I know, the Agatha Lottery would have to switch to her ace, Gengar. I landed a solid fly to his chest, but not before getting confused again. We took more confusion damage and continued to fly. I think this triggered some bug in Agatha's programming because she kept trying to use Dream Eater when we were on the ground. Either way, Arbok ended up being her last line of defense, and it couldn't stand up to a Fire Blast fly combo. This left us with Lance. I had a pretty specific strategy in mind for him. We needed to clear at least two Pokemon for Lapras to do a sweep. Frankly, I didn't trust six Blizzards would hit. I led off against Gyarados with Pikachu, which was risky. Gyarados is slow and very weak to electric attacks, but without a light ball, Pikachu had to rely on a critical hit to get a one-hit KO. Luckily, we avoided any big attacks. The first time he fired off a Hydro Pump that missed, so this run was pretty similar. Either way, Tantrum came in on Dragonair and delivered a solid Ice Punch. And for the second time in a major battle ever, we got a Scummy Freeze. Without potions, a Gen 1 freeze is impossible to recover from, and Lance doesn't have the right potion to fix one of those. Tantrum gets one over on the second Dragonair, 
but falls to a taste of his own medicine in Ice Beam. Permafrost Revenge kills, then attacks Aerodactyl with a blizzard after no selling a critical swift. We fire off another blizzard after taking a surprisingly powerful fire blast from Dragonite, and then move on to the champion. Surprisingly, Ebon is excited to see us for once, which I kinda get. He has a level advantage here, and all of his Pokemon are fully evolved. We have a very low chance of winning here. But in for a Poke Dollar, in for a Poke Pound, I guess. Game on. It's time for Rival Final. Ebon leads off with Sand Slash. Because it's facing a Bulbasaur, the AI will just spam Poison Sting. Which is fine for us, we just need two Razor Leaves to take it down. It is worth noting that while you do need a crit at level 50, it's still a 2 hit KO with a critical hit and a 3 hit KO without one. Talon becomes the pivot to take down Alakazan. Somehow, despite his terrible special, Talon survives a Psychic and manages to do major damage with Fly. He can't survive a Psybeam, so Permafrost comes out to revenge kill. Sadly, Permafrost is also too slow to revenge kill, and instead forces Alakazam into a battle of the battalions. Power versus power. And with Alakazam's amazing special stat, it lasts a while until I can land a solid blizzard to finish the job. Executor comes out next, so Hot Streak prepares to face him. He does well, tanking barrages and firing back with flamethrowers, but mentally I'm ready to switch him for Pikachu after he faints. Luckily we survive a final stomp from Executor to keep us ahead 5-3. With 4 HP and literally nothing else it can outspeed, I let Hot Streak do some chip damage to Cloyster with a slash before he succumbs to a clamp. Static jumps into revenge kill, but her Thunderbolt misses the roll and she gets stuck in a clamp. Permafrost pivots in for the save and tanks Spike Cannon. He strikes back with a critical Thunderbolt, which totally mattered. Nine Tails comes in and focuses on a tricky trapping strategy. A surf is enough to be a good counterattack, but not enough for cleanup, as Nine Tails traps Permafrost and finishes him off. Static comes in to revenge kill again, but gets hit with a Generation 1 miss. Nine Tails suffers the same fate, so another Thunderbolt sorts that whole thing out. But with Jolteon showing up, Tantrum needs to put in some work. Jolteon drops a Thunder Wave on Tantrum for good measure when I switch in, and then hits him with a Thunder. Poor guy didn't even stand a chance. Normally Bulbasaur would save a run here by using Sleep Powder and Leech Seed for the long game, but this time it's a critical hit Pin Missile which is 4 times super effective that demolishes Puff before he can even put his strategy into play. Bringing us back to the very beginning of the game, Static vs Jolteon. I take advantage of Pin Missile's poor accuracy and have Static double team up as much as she can, using the same move we used against Brock. Then we get our luck back with a Vengeance, with a critical hit body slam that paralyzes Jolteon, giving us a speed advantage. We hit it again with another body slam, and then manage to dodge a final quick attack before grabbing that spiky fox and pile driving it into the ground with a seismic toss for game. And that's it! We're in the Hall of Fame! Again, this is something I did with a level 51 Pikachu and everything else, but it seems to prove that there was a lot of good strategy mixed in with luck too. So that's it. Can you beat Pokemon Yellow without catching or evolving any Pokemon? Yes, and you can do it with a team that's roughly level 50. Ultimately, this challenge was incredibly fun. It felt more like a traditional RPG, specking characters that joined you as you went, that sort of thing. The fun parts also included using the starter squad for so long, and not having to wait a long time for them to get their ultimate and signature moves. I usually don't bother with any gift Pokemon after Viridian City. So it was pretty fun to try some new mons that I normally just leave in the PC or port GSC for breeding. This made for more creative moves. I found it funny that battles I normally struggled in as a kid like Misty Brock and Sabrina were a breeze, but battles like Erika and Koga were a challenge, whereas I used to breeze through them, Koga and Giovanni especially. The tough parts were these. Pikachu is rough to get through that first gym battle with, and accuracy reducing moves are a nightmare early on when you can't switch. The lack of stats on the Star Squad really starts to show after the mid game. Switching them into all but a resisted attack is suicide due to their lack of bulk. Even with the poor Gen 1 computer move sets, these were tough battles, especially with the level disadvantage we had at the very end. I'm confident that if we were even with at least Lorelei in levels, this would have been much easier, but I showed up for a challenge, and that's what I got. 
Also, I hadn't realized how little Kabuto and Hitmonchan really had going for them in Gen 1. No physical stab moves to take advantage of their amazing physical stats with. The bigger surprise is how little I was able to do with Aerodactyl. The only quote unquote good stab move it gets is Fly, and its defensive typing is truly wasted this generation. Realistically, Pikachu and Bulbasaur were the most reliable starters and did pretty well given their low stats and frailty. I can't tell you how badly I wanted a light ball, but all things considered, they fought pretty well, especially as a team. Bulbasaur to set up and Pikachu to deliver damage. Squirtle was okay too, very well rounded, but being well rounded only gets you so far. He still came in clutch in important matchups and is also a starter I would recommend. Lapras was certainly worth training up. He's a workhorse, and with a little more training, I think Lapras probably could have soloed the entire game if I let him. And to my surprise, Charmander did his fair share. He wasn't nearly as useful until I got him Flamethrower, and even after that he wasn't exactly a workhorse, but he did contribute. He pulled off a few surprising wins during the Elite Four for us, using some really good coverage moves and a surprisingly good offensive stat spread. I feel really bad for Eevee. Eevee has well-rounded stats and stab normal moves, but his stats are too low to be used effectively and has no Eevee alight, and that coverage is just abysmal, non-existent really. It has a worse moveset than Rattata. I just couldn't find a way to use it that was effective. I might try something like this again, maybe next time with a more specific Pokemon or two. I have a couple in mind. Until next time though, this is Battlemaster Ace, signing out.